afternoon, everybody. It is uh, noon on the East Coast of the US. Uh, my name is Kate Fitzgerald. I'm a professor at UMass Chan Medical School and uh, one of the co-organizers of this fantastic uh, seminar series. So it's a real pleasure. Today, we have a real treat. We have um, Dr. Veit Hernang joining us from Munich in Germany um, to talk about his work on innate immunity. Um, just before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that next week's speaker is Kristen Hoquist from uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, and now on to today. So, so it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Hernang fight as Professor of Immunobiochemistry at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, where he's been since 2015. Um, Fide is trained as a, a physician, so he did his MD actually also at the LMU in Munich. Um, and then after that, he was a, a research fellow and a postdoctoral fellow with Gunther Hartmann um, in Munich um, before moving to the US where he worked here at UMass Chan. Uh, we were lucky to have him. It was a really fun time back then. Uh, working both with my lab and also with Ike Latz, who was also here at the time. And, and Fight was really a tour de force in the lab. He worked, did some really foundational work, both on NLRP3 inflammasomes and also his discovery of the AIM-2 inflammasome uh, in our labs here. Uh, Fight then went back to Germany to uh, the University of Bonn, uh, where he was a professor of clinical biochemistry, um, and then a director of the Institute of Molecular Medicine at the University Hospital in Bonn, and then moved back to Munich, which I think is home, um, in 2015, where he's now currently chair of the immunobiochemistry department. And, and Fight's work is really focused sort of on hardcore innate immunity. He's done some elegant work on toll-like receptors, particularly self-non-self discrimination by nucleic acid sensing, TLRs, um, some really nice work on the rig eye like receptors, on C-gas sting, and, and I mentioned earlier some of his work on AIM-2 and NLRP3 inflammasomes. And he also has an interest in, in genome engineering, and over the last several years in particular has really focused his work on human innate immunity and trying to decipher mechanisms of pattern recognition in uh, the human system. So FIDE is the recipient of many awards. Um, I'll just name a few here. So he's been consistently uh, Thomson Reuters highly cited researcher in the field of immunology since 2014. Um, he's an elected member of EMBO. Um, he's got numerous other awards, including the 2020 William B. Coley Award for Distinguished Research in Basic and T Tumor Immunology. So we're gonna hear, I think, some really terrific science today, but as with all speakers, we typically have a question for them that sort of relates to their past sort of career history. And, and Fyde, the question I wanted to ask you is, what is the advice you would give to your 25 year old self? And of course you're only 25 now, so you can tell us, you can tell us the answer mm -hmm. to that question. So what, what would you tell your 25 year old self? Well, yeah, first of all, thank you, Kate, for this very kind introduction, for the invitation to, to be here. This is a fantastic series. I've, I've watched many of your um, broadcasts and um, yeah, I'm really delighted to be here. This is really cool. And yeah, thanks for, for introducing me. It's always a pleasure to be back on the virtually now here at UMass. Um, good to see you, Kate. Yeah, yeah. so um, to your question. So what would I tell my 25, let's say 25 to 30 year old, year old um, fight? Um, with regards, I guess, to career choices. So um, at the end of the day, when I, when I look back and um, look at the crossroads where I decided to go one or the other way, um, um, at, at hindsight, I always followed my, my instincts, which is probably, uh, sounds like a stupid advice, but at the end of the day, what, what does your instinct tell you? It tells you um, that you do something that you feel comfortable with. Um, so my advice would be follow your instincts, follow your interests, uh, follow, the crowd of people that um, you'd like to be with, the people you want to communicate with. Um, and I think this is always a good way to go. So at the end of the day, um, science is a tough job, as you all know, and you work hard hours. And it's, I think, always really good to be amongst people that um, 
you feel comfortable with that you'd like to talk to that are interesting that are smart that can talk to you and and so forth um, um so yeah take your time pick pick a group a peer group um and that will really nurture your interests and at the end of the day um, regarding specifically the postdoc period um i think this was probably one of the most um um, interesting periods of my research career and probably one of the most fun parts of my research career. Um, yeah. So don't over rush it, I would say. Um, take your time. The postdoc period is probably the, the best time um, or could be the best time of your life. I don't know. Depends on your. I, so I'd like to go back to being a postdoc. <laughs> Those were good old days. Not yet the, 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 the responsibilities of being a PI, not anymore the, the, the need to finish your PhD. And you can really dig very deep into a topic. And, and this is a really fantastic um, yeah, period of your career. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's great advice. And for all, you know, there's a lot of trainees actually from all over the world to tune into these um, talks. And I think they always like to hear the perspective of superstars in the fields like yourself so okay we're gonna we're gonna move on now to hear some cool science and by just gonna tell us about some i think unpublished and and i i'm suspecting will be very cool work and the title of his talk is innate sensing of bacteria what else is there to find and i suspect there is much based on your title so good take it away all right thanks bye Thanks, Kate. Yeah. Uh, I assume you can see my screen all right. I can. Yeah, everything okay. looks good. We can see your Zoom pointer. So, okay. yeah. So welcome to this seminar today. I'm going to talk about innate sensing of bacteria. And as Kate said, I'm really married to innate immunity. This is the, the core interest that has haunted me for, for my life, my research life. And before I start with a fully unpublished story, this is all unpublished data, which I'm going to share with you guys. I want to give you a little bit of a brief introduction into innate immunity and um, set some terminology straight um, for the people who come from, from different fields, maybe. So in innate immunity, we're interested in, and this is somewhat specific uh, to my group, we're interested in the sensing function of innate immune cells, how these cells understand that there is the presence of bacteria or viruses. And what these cells do is they use a certain set of receptors, um, germline encoded receptors, that sense the presence of certain um, microbial products or viral products um, that are typically non-self and not found in the host. And the terms that we use here in this context is on the one hand pattern recognition receptors for these receptors and PAMPs or pathogen associated molecular patterns for these molecules that are being sensed by these receptors. And in our simplistic understanding, I hope you forgive me here, there's only one red arrow, this will trigger a immune response. So we are very far upstream here in the innate immune cascade. Now, this whole field started by a really uh, fantastic article from Charlie Janeway that you probably all heard about. And I really uh, would ask you to go back and, and read this article, which was published in 1989, uh, Approaching the Asymptote in which he predicted the presence of such receptors, um, a sensory function of primitive immune cells that would sense the presence of non-self. And he suggested that these primitive immune cells would bear receptors that allow recognition of certain pathogen-associated molecular patterns, these PAMP molecules that are not found in the host. I term these receptors pattern recognition receptors. And he goes on to define um, what these receptors um, should sense and um, should look like. And he also goes on to define what a PAMP molecule should be. And he writes that um, PAMPs are general structures um, in molecules that are found in many microorganisms, but not in the multi multicellular organism in the host. And ever since, um, there was a hunt for these receptors and these PAMP molecules that, um, that activate these receptors. Now, as you know, there is a bunch of different pattern recognition receptors, and it all started with the toll-like receptor field. Um, this is a cartoon slide that illustrates the toll-like receptors that are expressed in the human system. There's 10 of them. They are transmembrane receptors. The ligand binding domain faces the outside, um, as it is shown here for, for example, toll-like receptor 4 or toll-like receptor 3, toll-like receptor 5. Some of them are found in the endolysosomal compartment, but again, the ligand binding domain would face um, the outside compartment, the one that can take up material from the outside. Now, when this all started, this was an exciting field. Um, um, as a group studied um, knockout mice for these receptors and identified the ligands that would trigger these receptors. 
And then it turned out that there's actually more than just toll-like receptors. There's C-type lectin receptors, also transmembrane receptors. There's nod-like receptors, RIGI-like receptors. There's the C-gasting axis and um, maybe a few more, um, but we're somehow um, coming at least um, with the genetic definition of these receptors um, to an end. Um, we have a pretty good understanding of what these receptors are and how they're hardwired to signal transduction, which does not mean that there's no other receptors out there. Now, what do these receptors sense? Um, so I started with the toll like receptor field and um, toll like receptors, TLA4, for example, senses a certain component of the bacterial cell wall. And here you see a cartoon slide, um, what bacterial membranes look like, um, gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, mycobacteria and fungi, which are obviously not bacteria, but here added in this slide. And there's a bunch of um, molecules that are typically non-self that um, can be sensed by such pattern recognition receptors. And one classic non-self molecule that you probably all know is lipopolysaccharide, which is um, anchored here in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria that have two um, membranes and this intermembrane space. And lipopolysaccharide is, is anchored to this outer membrane. And this lipopolysaccharide molecule is sensed by toll -like receptor 4. Um, which is one of these toll-like receptors that I mentioned in the beginning, which entertains a rather complicated signaling cascade uh, to which Kate contributed many important findings. And uh, upon binding of LPS, which actually looks rather like this than um, this cartoon slide that I showed you before, binding of LPS with this little help of my molecule MD2 then sets off the activation of this receptor, which will then trigger intracellular signaling and the activation of transcription factors such as nf -kappa b so this is a classic example that you um, probably are all familiar with. Now, another structure um, of bacterial uh, cell walls is this structure here, peptidoglycan, which um, forms a mesh-like structure that provides a certain rigidity to bacteria, especially gram-positive bacteria that don't have these two membranes. And peptidoglycan is a polymer that consists of um, various sugars. It's a basic structure. It's basically um, N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid, um, which are depicted here. And N-acetylmuramic acid is cross-linked to peptides, which are again cross-linked with one another to form a mesh-like structure. And here you see highlighted individual amino acids in this peptide linker um, that are non-typical amino acids, um, so to speak. And it's obviously um, clear that this is a classic non-self structure that could be potentially sensed by a, by a pattern recognition receptor. Um, but this is obviously now knowledge of, of, of today. Now, peptidoglycan has been used um, already extensively in the past as an adjuvant. Um, a very potent adjuvant is Freud's adjuvant, uh, which is a combination of paraffin oil, then heat killed and dried mycobacteria. And it's potentially the, the peptidoglycan in, from these mycobacteria that is the immunogenic source and an emulsifier. And for a long um, period of time, for many years, people try to find out what is the minimal stimulatory component in, in this adjuvant. And as I alluded to, this um, um, very likely turned out to be peptidoglycan. Uh, I say very likely because there's um, studies that all, also say that other components in Freund's adjuvant um, could be immunogenic, but very one very important adjuvant is peptidoglycan. And many groups um, in the 1970s tried to identify the minimal component of peptidoglycan that would be immune stimulatory. And one breakthrough paper was published in the mid-1970s where a group in France um, basically synthesized um, this sugar molecule highlighted here with two amino acid two amino acids, um, Murnac l ala d isoglutamin which turned out to be the minimal uh, active component of peptidoglycan that could trigger an immune response. And this is also classically referred to as MDP, or muramyl dipeptide, because it contains this Murnac moiety and these two amino acids. And what they studied in this paper in the 1970s, and this is synthesized molecules, so not peptidoglycan derived, is when they used this as an adjuvant and immunized guinea pigs, whether they would elicit an immune response. And they did so, and they could um, quantify antibody production when they um, immunized these um, guinea pigs. So this is one of the first PAMs, even though at that time, this is, um, remember, the mid-1970s, there was not yet a concept of pattern recognition receptors or PAMs, PAM molecules. Now, 
who, what receptor senses now MDP uh, neuronal dipeptide? And now we fast forward. Um, this is now in 2003. This is a very uh, famous paper uh, from the group of Stephen um, Girardin and Philippe Sansonetti, where they tried out different not like receptors in a heterologous expression system. So they overexpressed NOT1 and NOT2 in HEC 293 T cells that usually don't, do not express these receptors. And they studied whether these cells would now respond to MDP neuronal dipeptide or certain controls. And this is one of the key figures um, here on the lower right. So here they have HEC293 T cells where they overexpress NOT1 and NOT2 or TILA2. And then they stimulate these cells with neuronal dipeptide and see that there is a profound nf kappa B response if NOT2 is expressed, but NOT1 would not respond um, to this stimulation. And this provided first evidence that neuronal dipeptide is sensed by a pattern recognition receptor, namely NOT2. Um, so this is a, a classic paper, and um, if you have time, go back to this paper and, and read up on this. So NOT2, as I mentioned, is a, a, a not like receptor, nucleotide binding oligomerization domain containing um, receptor. It has this um, N-terminal CAR domain, which is important for signal transduction. A central NACH domain, which is important for ATP binding and potentially oligomerization, and a C-terminal leucine rich repeat domain. And here you see projected the different domains um, onto, the, onto the amino acids. And this is a, a model of NOT2. And um, again, you see the two CAR domains, the NACH domain, and the leucine rich repeat domains. If you would now extrapolate from toll like receptors, you could argue that it's potentially the leucine rich repeat domain that binds to MDP. Because for toll-like receptors, there's good biochemical evidence that the leucine rich repeat domain binds to PAMP molecules. Now, these two CAR domains um, signal via this adapter molecule RIPK2, which also has a CAR domain, is recruited to the CAR domain of NOT2. And upon recruitment of RIPK2, RIPK2 um, gets ubiquitinated and forms a scaffold onto which um, kinase complexes are recruited that then activate nf kappa b and MAP kinases. I have a slide in a second where you see the signaling cascade. Now, NOT2 um, turned out to be quite interesting also from a medical standpoint in light of the fact that there is certain mutations in NOT2 that lead to Crohn's disease. And in fact, NOT2 is the number one susceptibility gene locus for Crohn's disease. Um, almost up to 50% of all Crohn's disease patients in the Western Hemisphere have um, certain mutations in NOT2. And as it turns out, these mutations are loss of function mutations that render NOT2 less sensitive to uh, MDP stimulation. Um, this has been disputed for quite some time, but it's now, um, I think, agreed upon that um, these mutations are loss of function mutations. Now, why is NOT2 so important or NOT2 expression in certain cell types so important? And um, this is a review article um, image that I um, display here. So NOT2 is expressed in various cell types in the gastrointestinal tract and is important um, to maintain a healthy gastrointestinal barrier. And so it's not only expressed in enterocytes, but also in panis cells, goblet cells, and also in myeloid cells, which are not displayed in this um, slide here. So it's broadly expressed in many cell types. And if there's not to, no NOT2, there's no proper um, barrier function. So MDP is detected by NOT2. Uh, what is there still to find? This is a finding that was already published in 2003, um, more than or almost 20 years ago now. Is there anything we can discover in this pathway? And this is a question that um, Jay Stafford um, asked, um, a really fantastic postdoc from Australia that, um, who joined my lab, who was interested in studying this pathway in more detail um, using an exhaustive um, genome engineering and uh, forward genetic approach to identify uh, novel modulators in this cascade. And what Jay did is he used a gene trap approach to identify new regulators of the NOT2 pathway. And I just want to briefly explain this technology. So gene trap mutagenesis is based on the use of um, retroviruses that randomly integrate um, with a somewhat um, 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 predilection for um, expressed uh, gene loci. And what you design, you design uh, retroviruses that contain these gene trapping cassettes that have a splice acceptor site, a selection marker, and a polyadenylation signal. And when these gene trapping cassettes now insert into intronic regions, um, the normal transcription doesn't work anymore. 
the gene trap splice acceptor basically leads to splicing onto the gene trap. Um, the polyadenation signal leads to the um, termination um, um, of the transcription. And this leads to the expression of a truncated protein or no protein at all, in dependence of where the gene trap cassette is inserted. Now, you might wonder um, how this works in, in diploid cells, because if you mutagenize one gene locus, the other gene locus can buffer um, for this um, mutated gene locus. And that is uh, indeed the case. So what you have to do to use this technology is you have, you have to use a haploid system. And there's certain cell lines out there, and this is work pioneered by the Pummelkamp lab that are near haploid or almost completely haploid that can be used for such gene trap mutagenesis approaches. And one of these cells is the so-called KBM7 cell um, that was uh, first used by the Brummelkamp lab to, um, to conduct such uh, gene trap um, uh, mutagenesis approaches. And here you see um, the karyotype of, of these KBM7 cells, and you see that they're um, basically completely haploid um, with the exception of chromosome 8. Now, what you now do is you take these cells, you uh, infect them with a retrovirus uh, that contains a gene trapping cassette, and thereby you conduct this ultra-deep genome mutagenesis. And then you have your mutagenized cell population, which is depicted here in these colored dots that you then um, study in your, for your phenotype of interest. For example, um, this is a work done by a colleague in, in the laboratory or in the department, Lucas Jai, who studied um, the pathway of AKT phosphorylation, uh, where they found uh, Richter as a positive regulator of AKT phosphorylation and INPP4A as a negative regulator of an AKT phosphorylation. And what you do in this um, particular example, you take the cells, um, you um, stain the cells for phosphorylated AKT using a fax antibody, and then you subject these cells to um, fax sorting, and then you sort out the low expressors and the high expressors, and then you determine um, how gene trap mutagenesis has occurred in these two different populations. And based on the insertions, um, you can then infer if uh, a gene of interest is a positive or negative regulator. And this is what we did with uh, the lab of Lukas Jahr, who is a, a colleague here at the Department of Biochemistry, who has um, also um, worked in, in the Brummelkamp lab and has really pioneered this technology um, for fax-based screens. Now, in order to sort out cells in which not two signaling has occurred, uh, we looked for a very potent nf cover b um, activity signal. And what we came up at, uh, with in the end is um, that we constructed a cell line where we inserted an M scarlet protein into the I1 beta gene locus, the endogenous I1 beta gene locus. I1 beta is very nf kappa B sensitive, is highly induced upon activation of these cells. And if you insert an M scarlet cassette into the I1 beta gene locus, um, the cells will turn red if you activate nf kappa B, um, which you can do by not to engagement. And to show you how this works, and this is a fax plot of KBM7 cells that are now equipped with this I1 um, M scarlet reporter, and the mo cells move to the right if you still simulate them with L18 MDP. L18 MDP is a prodrug of MDP, so to speak. It contains a long um, A cell chain um, that is esterified to this uh, C6OH group and that makes it uh, membrane permeable. Uh, and that makes it a lot easier to work with than the natural MDP compound because it's not very well taken up into the cell. And if you now knock out NOT2 in these cells, you see upon L18 MDP treatment, there's no movement to the right anymore. There's no nf cover b activation in these cells anymore. You, we can also quantify this. Here we stimulate these cells that were constructed with this reporter with MDP. It's entirely not too dependent. L18 MDP, it's also entirely not too dependent. This is an agonist that activates NOT1, which is independent of NOT2. And this is TNF as another positive control, which is independent of NOT2. So the system works. Now we took these cells that were mutagenized and subjected them to selection to look for positive and negative regulators of NOT2 signaling by fax sorting. And now I show you the sequencing results of this um, screen. And the way the data are depicted here, here you see on the um, um, right axis, the total number of mutations in log 10 scale. And here you see the mutation ratio in log two scale. And all these dots that you find below this um, large cloud here are genes that upon perturbation lead to a lower nf kappa b signal. So these are positive regulators of the NOT2 pathway. And reassuringly, if we plot 
these positive hits that I highlighted here in orange color, we find a lot of hits from the NOT2 signaling cascade. We find NOT2 itself, we find R1 beta, which is our reporter, uh, we find RIPK2, the um, adapter molecule, we find an E3 ligase that is, that is important to form the scaffolding complex, we find components of the nf kappa b signaling complex, of the MAP kinase signaling complex, of nf kappa b itself, and so forth. So a very um, um, deep screen that finds a lot of known positive regulators. So we did this obviously not to find known regulators, um, but to find new regulators. And one thing that stood out, which is highlighted here in blue color, is this um, gene here, NAGK. And that obviously caught our attention because it was a very strong hit in, in our screen. So what is NAGK doing? So we looked up NAGK in the literature, and it turns out that NAGK is a um, kinase that um, for, um, phosphorylates certain sugars. Um, Glucknac is phosphorylated by NAGK to Glucknac 6-phosphate. And this phosphorylation step is important in a certain um, pathway, the so-called salvage pathway of UDP glucnac synthesis. So this is the metabolic pathway of UDP glucnac synthesis. This is UDP glucnac, and the key um, uh, pathways that channel into this pathway is glycolysis, amino acid metabolism, and fatty acid metabolism. And there's also a so-called salvage pathway, which can um, shortcut um, certain steps of this pathway. And for example, phosphorylate glucnac to glucnac 6 phosphate, which is an important component that is then um, isomerized to glucnac 1 phosphate and then metabolized to UDP glucnac. Now, what is this pathway good for? What is UDP glucnac good for? UDP glucnac is an um, important molecule that is used for uh, N-linked and O-linked glycosylation. And O-linked um, glucnac modification is a post-translation modification that is quite um, commonly occurring um, on cytosolic and also nuclear proteins. Um, so here you see O-glucnaculation, which is a post-translation modification. There's more than a, a thousand protein targets known up to date. And this um, post-translation modification is similar to phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. It can um, lead to the activation of certain pathways, inhibition, or association of certain proteins, um, so a PTM that can modify um, certain activities. So we were on the one hand intrigued by finding NAGK in this pathway and potentially being important for UDP glucnac synthesis. On the other hand, we're a little bit worried that we would hunt down for a rather complicated um, cascade here with a certain PT PTM being installed on a certain component of the NOT2 signaling pathway. Now, what we then did is we went back to our screening hits and looked if other enzymes of this cascade would also be found as positive regulators. We might have missed them because we only looked for highly significant hits. But doing so revealed that all other enzymes of this pathway were not significantly enriched in, in our positive regulator cloud here. Um, only NAGK, which is only part of this so-called salvage pathway, was required. Uh, for not to um, activation by MDP. And that kind of reassured us that um, it's not a post-translation modification that we're after, but maybe another function of NAGK that has um, not yet been described. So where is NAGK expressed? Um, to get some information on that, we analyzed publicly available data. This is the BioGPS data set. And that we reanalyzed, what we did is we took all these transcripts, uh, we looked for variably expressed transcripts in this data set, um, we looked for um, transcripts that are co-regulated with NAGK, and found 113 transcripts um, that are um, co-regulated with um, NAGK. And if we conduct a G-term enrichment analysis on these 113 transcripts, we find a lot of GO terms that are indicative of immune function. Uh, for example, immune system process, immune response, and so forth. And here you see four example transcripts that are highly co-regulated with NAGK. And these transcripts, if you take a bigger picture and look at these transcripts that are co-expressed with NAGK, um, as it is highlighted here, are basically transcripts that are expressed in myeloid cells. Simply speaking, NAGK is expressed in myeloid cells and it's co-expressed with my other myeloid transcripts. So this is NAGK expression in a color-coded um, plot here. And here you see NAGK expression, for example, in CD33 positive cells and being co-expressed with these other transcripts that are typically expressed or known to be expressed in myeloid cells. Okay, so that made it interesting, obviously. 
So um, how is NHK then required for MDP recognition? Um, so far, we only had the, the screening data at hand. Now we knocked out NHK and KBM7 cells to first validate our findings in now pure NHK knockout cells. So here you see three knockout um, cell clones or a pool knockout, a polyclonal pool knockout. And then we stimulated these cells with L18 MDP, MDP, and this is the not one agonist IADAP. And again, look for nf B activation using our fax readout. And reassuringly, uh, the NHK deficient cells were completely dead in signaling, um, but they still functioned in responding to uh, the not one agonist. And the same was true for other control stimuli that I don't show here. If we stimulate these cells for, with uh, TLA2 agonists, for example, or TNF or PMA, they will all respond fine. And HEK has no impact on these signaling cascades. So it's not somewhere downstream required for nf B activation. Now, so far we've used MDP, which is a synthetic um, component of um, peptidoglycan. What if we use um, peptidoglycan itself? Now to do so, we turn to a more reductionist setting, uh, we turn to not um, two expressing hex cells, because the advantage of this system is that in these cells only not two is expressed as a pattern recognition receptor. Whereas when we take myeloid cells and um, they express TLA2, not one, and peptidoglycan um, contains um, components and can activate all these different pathways. So now we take um, hex cells that express only not two. So this is basically a reductionist gain of function setting. And again, when we knock out NHK in these cells, um, they're totally dead for MDP recognition. But now we can use also complex peptidoglycan um, molecules like peptidoglycan from Staph aureus or E. coli. And again, these cells are totally dead for um, the recognition of these molecules. They don't produce IL-8 anymore, which is an nf kappa b regulated chemokine, indicating indeed uh, it's not only MDP that is not um, sensed anymore in the absence of NAGK, but it's also peptidoglycan. Okay, so this settles basically peptidoglycan as a precursor molecule for MDP, and that this is also an NAGK dependent. Now, at what level does NAGK interfere with NOT2 signaling? Now, a very proximal readout for NOT2 activation is the ubiquitination of RIPK2. Uh, RIPK2 needs to be ubiquitinated in order to recruit certain kinase complexes. So that is somewhat similar to TRAF6 or TRAF2 signaling, kinase complexes that get activated on these ubiquitin chains and then translate um, their activation downstream to certain transcription factors. And what you can do is you can basically pull down all ubiquitinated proteins in the cell and then probe for RIPK2. And if you find RIPK2 in the ubiquitinated pool of proteins, you can say it has been ubiquitinated. And this is what Che did in this experiment. So these are wild type THQ1 cells that are stimulated with MDP, L18 MDP for one hour or two hour. And he pulls down ubiquitinated proteins and then probes these um, proteins for RIPK2. And you see a very nice and strong smear coming up already one hour after stimulation. And this smear is entirely gone in the NHK knockout cells. And, and if we look at further downstream signaling molecules like uh, MAP kinase activity, P38 phosphorylation, P65 phosphorylation, phosphorylation of I kappa B alpha, it's all um, there in wild type cells, but it's gone in the energy K knockout cells. Further, what she did in collaboration with Mattia Manza from the uh, MAN department, he conducted a phosphoroproteome study of um, THP1 cells stimulated with L18 MDP um, or um, cells deficient for NHGK, and when he then um, conducts a, a phosphoproteome analysis, um, he sees a lot of proteins being phosphorylated downstream of NOT2 activation. These are um, molecules that are probably phosphorylated by MAP kinases or IKKs, um, but this is entirely gone in the NHGK deficient uh, THQ1 cell clone. Again, indicating that we're very far upstream with NHGK uh, impacting on NOT2 signaling. So it's not some branch da downstream of not 2 signaling, it's pro potentially very far upstream. And the furthest upstream we could um, go in these um, analyses is we conducted a not 2 dimerization assay in co collaboration with Monika Yabal and um, uh, Monika Pfauch from the um, Technical University. And they constructed not 2 constructs that upon oligomerization or at least dimerization lead to the reconstitution of the luciferase. And then you can read out luciferase activity using 
um, a certain um, enzyme reaction. And when MDP activates cells that express these two constructs, you basically have to complement the cipherase and um, the luciferase enzyme, and you can measure activity. And if we knock out NHEK in these um, reporter cells, MDP does not activate these cells anymore. So it's um, at the level or upstream of NOT2 that NHEK impacts on the signaling cascade. So what is NHEK doing? Now, I introduced NHEK in the beginning as a kinase that phosphorylates glucnac to glucnac 6 phosphate. And maybe some of you have already um, reasoned that uh, maybe MDP could also be a substrate for NEGK because MONAC is obviously very similar to GLUCNAC and could also be a substrate in the sugar moiety. And for GLUCNAC, it's the C6OH position that is phosphorylated by NEGK. Now, our first experiment alluding that this might be important um, came from this experiment here. So what Che did is he constructed cells in which he knocked out NAGK. Again, these cells are completely deficient for the NOT2 response if you stimulate them with NDP. And then he reconstituted them with wild type NAGK. So this is shown here in this slide. So these are the, the, the normal cells. These are the cells in which NAGK is knocked out. MDP is the blue bar. Um, you stimulate the wild type cells, you have your nf kappa v response, the knockout cells do not respond anymore. But if, if he puts back in the wild type enzyme, and the response is completely recovered. The cells activate nf kappa b just like the wild type cells. But if he puts in a mutant, an NGK mutant that has no catalytic activity anymore, um, this activity is entirely gone, indicating it's indeed the phosphorylating activity of NGK that is required uh, for not to signaling and not the protein itself or scaffolding function of the protein. Here's a control. This is activating not one, which is completely independent of all these uh, perturbations and stimulations. So is uh, MDP indeed phosphorylated? Um, and this is an essay that nicely illustrates this using a radioactive technique. This was done in co collaboration with Karina Mann. This is an TLC essay. And what we basically do is we incubate various substrates with recombinant NHEK and uh, P32 uh, uh, labeled ATP. And then on this TLC um, membrane, you let these compounds travel and then you expose this membrane and you can basically read out the presence of phosphorylated um, substrates and um, roughly um, if they have changed in size. And what you see here that the um, glucnac is being phosphorylated and um, here you see uh, a radioactive signal. This fat band down here is ATP itself. This is glucnac that has traveled on the TLC membrane being phosphorylated by NHEK, this is the known substrate. This is MONAC, um, the related um, sugar, which is also phosphorylated, and this is MDP. Um, so this is our MDP molecule incubated with recomb recombinant NHEK and ATP, and you see that MDP is phosphorylated. And here, I already take away that it's the C6OH position that is phosphorylated, and the phosphor group added here at this um, position. If we take a, an MDP molecule in which we exchange this OH group for an amino group, so six amino MDP, we don't see phosphorylation. Um, we see a slight tiny band and we ascribe this to an impurity of MDP in this preparation here. So this was not 100% pure, but uh, roughly contained 3% uh, MDP as we know from mass spec analysis. And another interesting finding an isomer of MDP, the so-called LL isomer, which also has no biological activity, is also not properly phosphorylated by NHEK, indicating that the specificity of NOT2 for the LD isomer is probably encoded by the upstream function of NHEK to, to phosphorylate MDP. So this radioactive assay we confirmed with mass spectrometry in conversion with uh, Thomas Fröhlich. This is uh, MDP plus ATP, we see MDP coming up in, in the LC um, curve here. If we incubate MDP with ATP in recombinant NHK, we completely convert MD MDP to 6-phosphor-MDP. And this um, can be also assured by looking at the molecular uh, weight of this molecule, which is exactly the addition of a uh, phosphor group. That uh, was quite reassuring. And we also conducted M NMR studies, which I don't show here, that clearly indicated that, is, that it is the C6OH group that is phosphorylated by NHEK. Now, the key question is, what is this 
phosphorylation step good for? Is it absolutely required to activate NOT2? And to test this, um, we conducted an assay in which we tried to bypass the requirement for NHK within the cell by directly delivering phosphorylated MDP into the cell. In our lab, we call this the, the so-called bypass experiment. So what we did is we took wild-type cells, cells deficient in NHK or not too deficient cells. We stimulated them with MDP or with uh, MDP that we had already phosphorylated in vitro using recombinant NHK. And now we can look if NHK cells um, again respond um, because they will not respond to MDP. And this is depicted here. So these are KBM7 cells deficient for NHK or not too. If we now provide uh, wild type cells with MDP, they respond. Um, if we provide uh, MDP to NHK knockout cells, they do not respond. Also, the NOT2 deficient cells do not respond. This is all known. But now if we directly um, deliver phosphor MDP into the cells, the NHK cells respond again, even better. Um, and then they respond, the, the, the wild type responds to um, MDP. And this is fully NOT2 dependent. The red bar is down. Um, almost um, to background level, indicating that the phosphor MDP is, of course, still sensed by NOT2. This is controlled by TNF. If we stimulate these cells with TNF, they all respond fine. So this indicates that indeed phosphor MDP can bypass the requirement for energy K within the cell. And I need to mention these experiments were carried out under conditions where we permeabilize the membrane with digitonin because phosphor MDP is too negatively charged and it will not properly pass in the membrane. And so here we permeabilize the cells with digitonin to deliver MDP and phosphor MDP into the cell. And if we conduct um, titrations of these compounds in these not two hex cells to determine EC50 values, uh, we determine EC50 values in the low nanomolar range and phosphor MDP is slightly more active than MDP in wild type cells. This is the purple bar here. And if we do this in NHK deficient cells, only phosphor MDP is active at a reasonable um, EC50 value of 0.1 roughly. Whereas if we now deliver MDP, we do see a little bit of an nf kappa b signal also now in NHK knockout cells, but at a very high concentration of MDP. This is a difference of four log scales. And these concentrations are never reached in cellulose. Um, in the context of infection or delivery of MDP. Um, so phosphor MDP dramatically enhances the activity um, or phosphorylation of MDP dramatically enhances the activity of MDP uh, towards NOT2 activation. Now, one thing we had not yet fully addressed is whether MDP is indeed converted into phosphor MDP within the cell. Uh, we assume that this occurs, but so far we haven't provided any proof that this happens. And the other conundrum which we had not addressed yet is how can L18 MDP, which we use for the screen and for many of our experiments, uh, be a substrate for NHK if exactly the C6OH group is basically uh, occupied by this ASAR chain to make it uh, more lipid, um, um, uh, lipophilic and membrane permeable. So what we uh, reasoned is that this um, is probably uh, removed upon cell entry by an um, unspecific esterase activity, but we, but we didn't find any esterases in, in our screen. And these um, enzymes can be very redundant. So we don't uh, necessarily assume that we would find a single enzyme that could basically remove this um, um, L18 um, molecule. Um, but nevertheless, to prove that this really occurs, we used mass spec. What we did is we, we took L18 MDP, we treated wild type or NHK deficient cells and subjected these cells then to LCMS analysis in collaboration with um, Carolina Sulek, um, Katrin Basilopoulou and um, Matthias Mann. And then we looked for L18 MDP, MDP and 6-phosphor uh, MDP in these cells. And um, these are the results. So first of all, we can pick up L18 MDP within the cell, which uh, is reassuring, but this is what we expect. And when we treat the cells, we measure L18, L18 MDP within the cell. And there's not much of a difference between the different genotypes. Now, if we look for MDP, which we did not deliver, which must be uh, generated by cleaving off this ASAL chain, uh, we do that MDP um, comes up in these cells now and to a higher level in the NHK deficient cells, which already alludes to the fact that under these conditions, MDP cannot be converted to 6-phosphor MDP. 
And indeed, if we now look for 6-phosphor-MVP, the, the key molecule we're interested in, it is only produced in wild type cells, but not in energy K, energy K knockout cells. This is entirely energy K dependent. So basically, this proved our assumption that indeed l mdp is converted into MDP and that MDP is phosphorylated to 6-phosphor-MDP by energy K within the cell. Now, finally, um, is this also relevant uh, for a physiological condition? Uh, what if we take mouse cells and deficient for energy K? And to study this, we generated a knockout mouse in collaboration with Benedict Wefers and Wolfgang Wurst. Uh, we cut out exon 2 to exon 5 from uh, the energy K gene locus. And we generated bone marrow derived macrophages from these mice and stimulated these macrophages with MDP. And, and lo and behold, and reassuringly, if we do so, TNF production or R6 production as classic nf kappa b driven um, cytokines are entirely energy K-dependent in these macrophages. The levels of um, TNF and R6 production are clearly lower um, than when we stimulate TLA2 with PAM3 CSK4, um, but this is known for the NOT2 signaling cascade that it's not um, um, the same um, activator as TLA2 pathways or other TLA um, pathways um, for nf kappa b activation. But nevertheless, the nf kappa b signal that we get is entirely energy K dependent. Again, we looked at uh, RIPK2 ubiquitination as this very proximal readout um, of the NOT2 signaling cascade. And you see that in the energy K deficient cells, there's no um, RIPK2 ubiquitinated anymore. And also, nf kappa b activation, phosphorylation of i kappa b alpha, um, MAP kinase activation, phosphorylation of p38 is entirely blunted in the absence of energy K. What Che also did is he took wild type bone marrow derived macrophages and energy K deficient macrophages and challenged these macrophages with MDP or PAM3 CSK4. And what he observed is that, um, again, a lot of um, proteins are phosphorylated when you stimulate these cells with these um, PAM molecules. But all these phosphorylation events that you see by stimulating the cells with MDP, and they're gone in the energy K deficient cells, whereas these cells are totally fine if you stimulate them with PAM3 CSK4. Again, proving um, the absolute requirement of energy K for the NOT2 signaling cascade. Now to sum up and um, coming to, to the end here, um, what we show is that um, indeed, it's not MDP that is the pump that activates NOT2, this very old pump, so to speak, that was uh, first synthesized in 1975, but it is phosphorylated MDP. And the cascade could be as follows. This is peptidoglycan, uh, the uh, release of MDP, which is to some extent understood, but not fully understood. Um, it must not necessarily be MDP. It can also be MTP with a tripeptide. And we also see that uh, MTP, these tripeptides, uh, molecules are also energy K dependent, but um, for the sake of this um, example here, we look at MDP. Um, so MDP is released from peptidoglycan and energy K uh, phosphorylates MDP to generate 6-phosphor-MDP. And this is the molecule that is actually the pump um, that activates NOT2. We don't have biochem biochemical data that show direct binding of MDP or 6-phosphor-MDP to NOT2. Um, this turns out to be extremely challenging and something that we're working on, but this is also something that people have uh, failed to really convincingly show for, for many years. Um, so maybe there's other modifications on NOT2 that are required to fully allow the biochemical reconstitution of the binding of 6 phosphor mdp um, to NOT2. Um, so why is this relevant? Why is there an additional step required um, that phosphorylates this molecule MDP to generate 6-phosphor-MDP? And um, I don't have an answer here, um, but the, the proper question would probably be not why, but when. Um, but because as it turns out, um, AM, energy K is, is a highly conserved enzyme um, that you also find in bacteria. And here it's also important for peptidoglycan recycling in archaea and in, in many um, animal species. On the other hand, NOT2 is a rather recent development of, in evolution. You find it in vertebrates, in fish, amphibia, um, not in, in birds, and obviously in mammals, this is um, human um, and NOT2. So in other words, um, energy K has always been around, whereas NOT2 arose um, far later in evolution. So 
there was always 6-phospho-MDP around if uh, MDP gains access to the cytosol. And this is something that NOT2 could have evolved um, to detect and not MDP in the first place. Um, this is what we believe. Just one tiny hint um, um, that this theory is, is probably uh, um, correct. And what we did is we expressed a disinjury related NHEK um, variant in, in human cells that lack NHEK. And what we took is we took Drosophila um, NHEK or the orthologous enzyme in Drosophila, which is called CG6218. And we reconstituted NHEK deficient cells and, and looked whether this would reconstitute the signaling cascade. And as we somehow expected, indeed, if we do so, um, these energy K deficient cells can respond to MDP stimulation. So this is KBM7 cells that we study for nf kappa B activation. They're deficient in energy K. And if we um, put in the Drosophila enzyme, we can fully reconstitute the lack of activity of the energy K deficient cells. And when we stimulate them with MDP, these are the blue bars. IDAP, which activates not one, is again independent. And if we do the same, uh, with another readout. This looks at IP, IP10. This is the knockout cells. If we put in Drosophila energy K, we can reconstitute the pathway. Not to the same extent as the wider condition, but um, to a considerable extent. So in other words, um, energy K in, in very distant species also phosphorylates an MDP, um, which would generate 6-phospho-MDP in the cell. Hence, we believe um, that NOT2 must have evolved to sense um, the phosphorylated form of MDP and not MDP in the first place. Yeah, and with this, I conclude and uh, would like to thank people involved in this work. Um, this was a very collaborative project, as you might have realized. And throughout the talk, I acknowledge a bunch of collaborators that, that are listed here again. Um, Evelyn Fesser, Lukas Jahr, um, um, Katharina Sulek, um, Catherine uh, Basilopoulou, Maria Tanza, Matthias Mann, um, Karina Mann, Thomas Fröhlich, um, Monika Pfauch, Monika Jabal, Benedikt Wefers and Wolfgang Wurst. Uh, many people from the lab, um, Alicia Gassauer, Gunnar Kuh, Dennis Nagel, Sophia Schmoyer, uh, Andreas Wiest, um, but most importantly, uh, Jay Stafford, who really drove the project, uh, who's highlighted here again, uh, who really did a fantastic job in, in driving this project and, and pushing this project forward. And at the end, if you're interested in this type of science, conducting genetic screens, hunting down the biochemistry, um, send me an email. Um, we have bunch of interesting positions available. And yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you. And with this, I would conclude and thank you for your attention. Fabulous fight. That was really, really super cool. Very elegant. And I love how, you know, reconstituting with the the mutant and, and not the, the, well, you know, just super solid story. Yeah, very, very interesting. All right, let me quickly share my screen just so I can direct people to how we do the questions here. Um, let's see. Okay, can everybody, okay, you can see that fight, right? Yep, thank okay. you. All right, so so as those following the talk here live are, are even recorded, so we do the questions here through Twitter. Um, so you can look for the Global Immunotalk um, Twitter handle and then um, ask questions for Dr. Fayed Hernang and Fayed is going to use his own um, Twitter account. So at V underscore Hernang and I'm sure there will be lots of questions and Fayed, I have a few interesting ideas we can maybe <laughs> follow up on uh, offline as well. Yeah, very, very nice work. Thanks, Kate. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And remember, again, next week's speaker is Kristen Hoquist. And uh, fight, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening in Munich. And goodbye, everybody else. Yep. Thanks, Kate. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Great. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>